Um, covering four continents. So we have birds from Asia, Africa, South America, and North America. Um, it seems like two of our stars right now, who's up front and center, is our Congo peafowl. Um, they're actually a vulnerable species in terms of their conservation status. Um, and part of that is because all the birds that are in here share a similar habitat, even though they're from different countries. Um, all of them require woodland types of habitat to survive, and that is something that is being heavily um, logged or cleared for mining and agriculture. So everything in here is feeling an environmental impact based on um, development of their habitats. Um, the Congo peafowl are from Africa, and they get their name because they live in the Congo Basin. Um, they are related to the Indian peafowl that roam the park but obviously a distant cousin um, since they are geographically separated. Um, he does have a crest, but his are these white little plume feathers on the top of his head. Um, and he does display similarly to peafowl, but he actually flares up his actual tail feathers, whereas Indian peafowl are flaring up their coverts. Um, right behind him who joined us, is a our male cock of Iraq. They are from the cloud forests of the Andes in South America. Looks like he just grabbed a grape, which is one of his favorite foods. Um, they also, since they require cloud forests, that is an area that's being um, developed. And so they're having less and less habitat themselves in terms of what they can grab onto. Um, what's cool about them is that uh, I personally think that they kind of sound like a dinosaur, which is not surprising to me since they are the relatives of dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are some birds' ancestors. Um, in terms of nesting, they're um, pretty interesting in terms of that they actually use a cliff face. So we have a nest box that's kind of off the exhibit where the female is probably up there nesting right now because we are in the breeding season. So if he makes a ruckus, I apologize in advance. Um, the pendulum looking birds um, with their tails ticking back and forth, those are blue crowned mot mots. Um, looks like that's actually one of our chicks that were juveniles that hatched out this year. Um, they fledged in September of 2020. Um, they are from Eastern Mexico. So they're more of a Central American bird. Um, in terms of their nesting, they do obviously require some forest, but instead of being up in the trees, they actually nest in the ground. So they build a big tunnel system, usually in the back of this aviary, and that's where they raise their chicks. So we actually don't see them until they fledge, um, since they have a nice little bunker where they raise their young in. Um, this year we hatched out, um, I think there are two males and one female along with mom currently in this aviary um, but it looks like they're already starting to get their pendulum feathers so they're getting closer and closer to adulthood um, we also have a lot of canopy dwellers because up top i spot our red crested taraco which is another um, canopy african bird um, I think we just talked about Chiracos on our uh, social media because they are very interesting in case you missed it. Because um, a lot of birds, in terms of their plumage, um, it's actually refracted light. So if you were to hold a bird's feather up to light, it actually wouldn't have that color. So even though the cock of the rock looks orange, he is not actually pigmented orange. But that is not true for our red-crested Taraco. If you hold up her red and green feathers, she actually does have pigment due to how they carry copper in their feathering. Um, mm. Some of the other little birds you see flittering about are um, bulbils and tanagers. Um, up top, I can see one of our red vented bulbils, which is our Asian species in this aviary. Um, they're mostly around India and countries surrounding that area. 
Um, what's an interesting story about them is that they've actually been introduced to other places like Hawaii and are considered invasive. Um, so even though, of course, we want to protect forests for them in India, they are actually causing problems in other parts of the world because they are generalists and so they tend to push out um, native birds that are more specialists since they tend to do better in not as specific environments. So if they end up on an island, they disrupt the whole ecosystem. Um, I'm trying to see if I can still spot the trucheal. If you guys spot a bright yellow bird up above, that is a our Venezuelan trupial, which they are from South America. They are similar to the U.S.'s Baltimore Oriole in terms of their size and color and vocalization. Um, we did have chicks from them this year as well. Um, and it's, a, it's two clutches, so we have an older sister and a younger brother and sister in here, but it looks like they're hiding from us today. Um, <laughs> he's kind of defending his little territory with all of these vocalizations he's making. Um, he likes to let us know where he is and where he's at. Um, right now he is a singleton, so he doesn't have a girlfriend right now, but if he did, he'd be up front and center trying to distract us from her. Because um, if she were nesting, he'd kind of call all the attention to him um, and let her remain on the nest. Because he has a brighter coloration. He has all these blue feathers on his chest and that red patch underneath his throat. Whereas the female is similar to the Indian peafowl is more brown in color so that she wouldn't be as visible on a nest. Um, he wants to attract the attention of the girls though. So he has a little bit of a brighter coloration. But since he is a floor forest dweller and doesn't really want to call too much attention to himself, he does have that dark coloration to blend in so that nothing tries to make a snack of him. Um, Cleo is not out today because um, he's actually getting his yearly checkup. So it was just bad timing in terms of when this video went. <laughs> Um, so he is doing well, but every year he has to have a yearly checkup just like us. And so he is um, at the vets currently, but he'll be out soon. Uh, how many species are in this uh, free flight area? Um, I think we have at least 10. Um, the sound you're hearing right now is the trupial that I talked about before. They have a very pretty song. Um, what is interesting about them, because I mentioned we did have chicks this year, is that um, they actually don't build their own nests. So this year they actually piggybacked off of the red vent and bulbul nest that they built this year. Um, and they raised their chicks in there. So they're considered nest parasites. Um, so they like to more so move into a house than build it themselves. Looks like our mot mots are doing a flight show. Uh. <laughs> Um, do all the birds in here have names? Um, they do not. Uh, we have a lot of birds in our collection, and if we named every single one, it would get very redundant, and eventually we'd probably have to double up on names. So I guess an example is I have 57 Tavetta Golden Weavers alone in Kopi. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but we do have um, color bands on them. So every bird has a different color band so we can tell who's who, as well as an ID number and we keep them all straight. And despite us not naming everyone who's in here, they all do have different personalities and you kind of get to know how each species behaves. Um, Cocker rocks are more boisterous in nature where some of our tanagers are being a little camera shy and headed up in the canopy, but that's a natural behavior for them. Because um, if there's any disturbance in the woodland type forest habitat that they come from, they tend to go off in the trees where it's a lot safer. So there's not a lot of predators that can follow them all the way up. Since there are so many different species here, uh, is it difficult to feed them? Do they all get kind of the same diet or do they have specialized diets? Um, so we feed out different things depending on the diets of different birds. Um, for example, our Congo peafowl is more of a forager. So he is omnivorous and kind of eats um, whatever he can get his beak on. Actually, when Cleo does have his snack out here, which is usually a mixture of nuts, he goes right underneath them and collects all the little bits because his beak isn't strong enough to break up the nuts. So he waits for Cleo to do it for him. Um, 
Whereas our Turaco and Cacada rocks, they are considered more fruit eaters. Um, so they usually tend to use, we feed out enrichment fruits for them, so it's not the same thing every day, but they also get a frugivore diet. Um, the tanagers who we see peeking out right there, you might see a brilliant silver beak on one. They are called silver beak tanagers. Um, and they're more, they do eat fruit, but they do tend to tend to focus more on insects, um, which is good for us since we obviously don't want insects in our house. So it is very nice that birds do the favor of eating insects for us and keeping those populations in control. Um, and down below, we have a whole different subset. These are our blue-winged teals. They're a North American species, so you can at certain times of years actually see them in Illinois. Um, but they, are, they cover most of the North American continent. Um, they are dabbling ducks, so they more so sit at the water surface, and they are mostly vegetarian, eating the aquatic vegetables, but they do also um, snack on insects whenever they get the chance for a little protein kick. Uh, what's the average wingspan for the peafowl? I don't know exact wingspans, but he's a little smaller than the um, Indian peafowl that roam the park. Um, they probably more so have, like, if they're, it's a bigger male and tip to tip, I would think that an Indian peafowl might hit four foot wingspan, but not much more. He's probably closer to two and a half, three. Uh, which bird in here is usually the most vocal? Uh, it depends. It seems like the cock of the rod and Cleo, our macaw, <laughs> often have a bit of a duet going. Um, we are in the breeding season, um, and so the cock of the rock is making it their um, display songs. He is brightly colored, but he also does a call to get the attention of the ladies, because males do kind of compete, but that competition seems to draw the attention in, so they do kind of play off of each other. Um, but Cleo does like to chatter a bit. He doesn't enunciate very well, but he does mimic like some macaws can. And um, he definitely has everyone beat in terms of decibel lo level. He can probably make the loudest calls compared to everyone in here, but they sure do try. <laughs> Are any of the birds in here endangered? Um, the one that is, is um, our Congo peafowl. They are vulnerable. Um, so in terms of the Congo Basin, it, a lot of it's being processed for agriculture or mining or even logging. Um, so they're losing their habitats due to the pressures for development. But even though everyone else in here is um, considered least concern and doing pretty well, that doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way since everything in here is losing their habitats and it's only a matter of time before they also get labeled that status. So the more we could do to um, protect the habitats before they become an endangered species, the better, because once you get to that point, it's harder to get them to bounce back. So everyone in, in here is experiencing something, but definitely the Congos are the ones who are the most at risk right now. Is there anything that people in Chicago can do to, um, you know, help these environments that are on the other side of the world sometimes? Um, well, one thing is always when you look at uh, what you are using in terms of being a consumer. Um, try to pay attention and be an educated consumer because um, there are some things that are being uh, manufactured that aren't a recycled or, re or sustainable resource. Um, so the more we can do in terms of recycling, whether it's paper products or not using necessarily single-use products, the better um, because we don't have to clear those areas if we aren't needing the materials needed for that. Um, and every place is also being impacted by plastics usage. So a lot of these guys actually use waterways, whether it's the ducks or the cock of the rocks. Um, and the mot mots actually usually nest by a bank because they build their nests underground in banks. And if their waterways are clogged by plastics, um, that's not very good for them or us. So the more we can limit our single use plastic usage, um, another thing you can look into is that a lot of products have palm oil in it, and that's one of the trees that are often um, processed and forged, and that's a big cause of deforestation in a lot of areas. 
Um, there are some companies that actually have a list or of um, palm oil free products, whether it's a candy or a cosmetic. Um, and you can kind of do a quick Google search and they'll usually tell you which companies are palm oil free to limit that. Cause that is something that is um, causing a lot of problems for a lot of species. Um, Cause they need their homes and their trees to live in. Cause a lot of these guys are tree nesters and if those trees are gone, then they're kind of sunk. <laughs> the mott mutts are moving so fast that by the I time know. I have the camera on them, they're <laughs> gone. <laughs> Yeah, everyone in here is pretty quick. Um, we do do a daily inventory. So even in aviaries where we have a lot of birds, we try to get our eyes on every single one of them every single day. Um, of course, that doesn't happen every day, but usually every couple of days we do see everyone. Um, they are very, very fast moving, but that is why if I have any birders watching, why we wear binoculars to get a better look. Um, because they are very fast and sometimes you only get a glimpse, even us. Um, thank you for joining me. Today was National Bird Day, so we wanted to celebrate a bunch of the birds we have here um, at Brookfield Zoo. And I hope you enjoyed the chat and have a wonderful day.